A leaked memo just came out from a Google researcher saying that Google has no competitive moat in AI. Is he right? Let's check it out. All right, so this document just came out courtesy of the folks from Semi-Analysis. This apparently was leaked or shared by an anonymous individual on a Discord channel that uh, says he's a researcher, he or she's a researcher from Google. So let's see what this researcher had to say. So right from the get-go, right, the researcher says, we have no moat, but neither does OpenAI. So apparently Google has been doing a lot of soul searching over the past few months especially after OpenAI's announcements, trying to think or figure out, oh, what's the next milestone? What's the next move to make? But the author says, okay, we aren't actually positioned to win this arms race and neither is OpenAI. And I think it's fair you could substitute OpenAI with any of the other tech giants, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, anyone working in this uh, generative AI space. But the author says, okay, it's squabbling for a while and the third faction that's been eating our lunch is actually open source. So as the author says, put plainly, open source is lapping Google. I think that's an interesting point, right? The media has portrayed the AI wars as, you know, between Google, Microsoft, between Apple, Amazon, all the tech giants. And, you know, for for many like reasons, I think that's still true, still valid, right? These companies are the ones that have all the GPUs, all the servers, all the data, and certainly all the researchers and scientists to be able to, to build these models. But I think what's been especially true in the last year or so has been really just this rise or the proliferation of open source models and the, the strength of the open source community to really move fast, uh, to iterate, to, to release things, even if they may have questionable permission or or licensing uh, but yeah so it's it's definitely an interesting thing it's, and this third force uh if you will uh, is one to be reckoned with i would say all right so let's go back so the researcher calls out you know, several of the major open problems that uh, google you know once thought were things that still had to be solved were already you know there are already solutions there are solutions in open source and people have it, uh, access to them today. So some of them include large language models on a phone. Several people are able to run models on a, even a Pixel 6, five tokens per second. You can see people actually create personalized AI on a laptop that's built in an evening. Uh, and even several art models you know, are fully released with no restrictions whatsoever. And even some of the state-of-the-art models in the science Q&A uh, area, uh, that was built apparently in open source and trained in just an hour. So the researcher recognizes that even though Google may still have a slight edge in terms of the quality of the models, that gap um, is closing quite quickly. So open source models are faster, more customizable, more private, and in researchers words pound for pound more capable and doing so with uh, much less money right whereas Google might be building a model uh, with a 10 million dollar budget with many more parameters open source is able to recreate it with just a hundred dollars and 13 billion parameters so and the iteration cycle right it's in weeks not months so what does that mean right what what, what sort of implications does that have? Well, the researcher says, uh, we have no secret sauce. Our best hope is to learn from and collaborate with what others are doing outside of Google. We should prioritize through third-party integrations. People will not pay for a restricted model when free, unrestricted alternatives are comparable in quality. We should consider where our value add really is. I think that's a really good point. When something is free and freely available and able to be installed you know, on your local laptop, local machine, uh, with maybe just a few steps or is hosted behind some web server you know i think that shows that you know people could can be willing to sacrifice quality especially if the value proposition is still like really strong right so if a model that's let's say 70 or 80 percent of what chat gpt is right if i can get an approximation of that and run it on my own machine on my own data customize um, on my own you know however i want it you know I think that actually creates a strong 
you know, value proposition for people to be like, you know, why would I want to pay for an alternative and rack up a huge, you know, API bill or cloud cloud spending bill uh, when I can you know, do the, a little bit of extra work from my side and stand one of these up uh, things up myself. So yeah, quite interesting. It's a good point. So another thing the researcher says is that giant models are slowing us down. I think this is proven out uh, by the latest results from models from Llama, Alpaca, Vicuna. Like all of these have shown quite uh, strong capabilities in their on their benchmarks on, on the, the quality of their outputs and these are much smaller models than the unknown number of parameters that make up BARD or ChatGPT or any of these massive uh, AIs. So definitely quite interesting to, to call out. So how do we get here? So the researcher says that at the beginning of March, the open source community got their hands on the first really capable foundation model called Meta's uh, Llama. Getting access to that model, which at the time, you know, had no instruction or conversation fine tuning, no reinforcement learning from human feedback, but just literally having access to it uh, allowed the community to then you know, run wild and, and do things. So the researcher calls out that after, you know, soon after it was released, uh, variants started popping up where the instruction fine tuning, quantization, quality improvements, human evals, multimodality, RLHF, uh, many different versions were, you know, soon came out and uh, they soon were able to figure out how to solve that sort of scaling problem that uh, traditionally was only available or only uh, possible you know, at one of the hyperscaler type companies uh, to do. But now anyone could actually tinker and, and build this. So, and these ideas were from ordinary people, right? You didn't need a PhD, you didn't need necessarily super strong expertise in machine learning to be able to participate and iterate. So that barrier of entry, much lower, was, was you know has, has dropped a ton. Uh, so yeah. So in terms of why we could have seen it coming, interestingly enough, like while a lot of what uh, the researchers talked about so far has been in a large language model space, the researcher actually calls out that this um, development, this, this change, really began on the image generation side, right? When uh, stable diffusion became popular, this sort of equivalent moment happened in the large language model space as well. That sort of environment was uh, about uh, having a cheaper mechanism for fine tuning, specifically called low rank adaptation or LoRa, combining that with breakthroughs in scale and yeah, having a high quality model, having access to a high quality model allows people to, to iterate and to, to just Think at the level of abstraction of ideas as opposed to sort of the messiness of, of infrastructure or, or data or math, you know, those sort of things. So yeah, this sort of stuff outpaced a lot of the, the larger players. And what's interesting is that, yeah, the researcher calls out the difference between stable diffusion and DALI. So DALI is OpenAI's uh, image generation model. So in comparison, right, uh, while both of these models offered a similar capability, and I forget the timeline exactly, but I think OpenAI was first uh, when they announced uh, a very strong image generation model. Um, because Stable Diffusion was open source, right, this led to uh, you know more product integrations, marketplaces, user interfaces, um, innovations, designs, demos, like all those sort of things just came out because it was more available and allowed people to to download it, to try things out and to uh, put things out there. So it soon came to be that the differentiation wasn't actually in the like individual quality of that model. Uh, it was really in just the speed at which you know, the open source movement could could actually take people, right? How fast people could iterate, how fast people could try out new new things and ideas. So interestingly enough, there were a few things that, um, yeah, the researcher calls out that I think give us a little bit of a glimpse at to the Google's 
way of doing things as the, the Google approach to, to doing research. So yeah, so apparently they were not necessarily using um, the LoRa approach, uh, the low rank adaptation, but instead they were kind of taking a more costly approach to doing fine tuning of, of models. So yeah, fascinating. The fact that you're able to personalize a language model in a few hours on consumer hardware, it's a big deal, um, especially if you want to incorporate new and diverse knowledge in re real time. So yeah, the fact, yeah, the fact that this technology exists is underexploited in site Google, even though it directly impacts some of our most ambitious projects. So I think it calls out right there that maybe Google, uh, because they weren't uh, starved for resources, they did not sort of adapt or take into consideration, you know, the ability to just quickly iterate or make some sort of engineering uh, breakthroughs to, yeah, to sort of get results faster with less capable hardware. So this could very much be a, a, a big company problem. So in terms of like why uh, LoRa is efficient or effective is that it's, it's stackable uh, improvements like instruction tuning can be applied and then leveraged as other contributors add on dialogue or reasoning or tool use. While the drill fine tunes are low rank, there's some need not be allowing full rank updates to the model to accumulate over time. Okay. Basically, what this is saying is that the researcher is calling out that uh, even small incremental improvements that can be added to uh, by anyone, right? Um, those, if you sum them up over time, right, they can actually, you know, give much better results, much, uh, you know, encourage a stronger evolution of the model than than anything uh, individual. So yeah, so this means that as new and better data, data sets and tasks become available, the model can be keep cheaply kept up to date without ever having to pay the cost of a full run. So this detail is really about, yeah, training a model from scratch, super expensive, but if you can update them in a quick iterative way uh, and not have to do the full run training, for sure, you'll be saving a lot of uh, a lot of money. Yeah. So these are more details about just why training from scratch is not effective. So more more points around this: large models aren't capable in the long run if we can iterate faster on smaller models. The low rank adaptation models, or low rank adaptation updates, are cheap to produce, and the fact that they and the fact that Google is focusing and the fact that Google is focusing on maintaining some of these models uh, actually put the fact that Google is focusing on maintaining some of the largest models actually puts them at a disadvantage. Uh, it's one of those things where you know, size might not actually be all that's uh, you know hyped up to be because yes well you know a very large model could be strong in a moment right we live in a dynamic world where things change, where new information comes up, new knowledge is created, and you need to update that. And if the sheer fact that something is so massive that it can't be updated quickly, that means that, uh, yeah, if you have the ability to quickly iterate um, with fewer resources, you might end up actually winning uh, the whole thing. So the fact that yeah, data quality scales better than data size. Um, it's another aspect where uh, the community has actually done a ton of work on curating high quality data sets and just making them freely available. And interestingly enough, the researcher calls out that if you directly try to compete with open source, that's a losing option, right? And centralizes on the question of who would pay for a Google project product that has usage restrictions if there's a free, high quality alternative without them. The modern internet runs on open source for a reason and it has significant advantages that Google or any tech, big tech company cannot replicate. This sort of also just calls out the differences of concerns that an individual uh, who's hacking on an open source model doesn't have to worry about you know, compared to a giant like Google uh, Facebook, 
uh, Microsoft, etc. It's like because they don't have to worry about licenses in the same way as corporations do, right? This really does allow people to to play with you know these models to actually interact with them. Um, one of the things that is true is that at least in my experiences with major companies is that the if a model is not doesn't have a friendly license, if an open source model or an open source code doesn't have a friendly license, uh, that might just get passed on or passed over. Even no matter how good, no matter how uh, strong that project is um, or that model is, right? If it's not friendly for commercial use, then fortunately there's no path uh, to actually interact with or use that. But that's different in the uh, individual setting, right? People are not bound to these sort of restrictions or licenses. And yeah, that really does allow you to you know, play with things, innovate and, and, and go beyond. So one also important thing to call out is that uh, the open source community are very vocal, very passionate, very uh, strong experts actually in, in, in niches that a large tech company has no way or has no business in in, in staying you know, as, as deeply involved in. So for example, uh, they call out like anim anime generators or HDR landscapes, right? These are awesome community-led uh, initiatives, but uh, unless a company is like specifically focused on this particular area, right? There's no way that Google, Microsoft, or any of the big companies could dedicate as much time and attention to that niche. So that's, that's a big, big point. Interestingly enough, the uh, researcher says that the winner in all this is Meta because they basically got a bunch of free labor from open source. And that sort of innovation was not happening on top of their infrastructure. So they had nothing stopping them or no, no costs incurred to actually directly incorporate those sort of things into their own products. So yeah, the fact that if you can own the ecosystem, that puts you in a very strong position. You know, Google itself has had a lot of platforms that they've successfully uh, dominated in, whether that be in the browser, like with Chrome, or on the operating system, mobile operating system, like Android. So, you know, you would think that Google would be much further along or much uh, more capable here. Yeah, and the fact that the, these models are more tightly held, more tightly controlled, then uh, the alternative, right, which is open source, becomes much more uh, attractive uh, of a choice. So, yeah, so really to, to sum it all up, yeah, it actually is not a competition, in, at least in this researcher's mind, between the, the tech giants, right? It's not. Google versus OpenAI, Google versus Amazon, Google versus Apple or Microsoft. It's actually Google versus the open source community. So this uh, sort of fear or apprehension or whatever concern, competitive concern that they have around other companies, right? Instead, they should be looking to win the hearts and minds of, of open source. So, so with that, I'm sure the researchers hoping to instigate a wake-up call within Google, but we'll see. Yeah, I think it's a very fascinating piece. I, for one, am certainly intrigued that, that this got leaked, uh, but yeah, it, there are a lot of good points here overall. So what are my thoughts? You know, I think overall, it's there are a lot of strong points that are made that it's not just about Google, right? Any big company that is working in this space uh, and devoting hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of resources to try to, to try to compete, right? They should for sure be paying attention to what's going on in open source. And if anything, you know, finding ways to partner with the community as a way, as opposed to alienating them, you know, that's, that's a big thing. So, and from my experiences working with open source projects, right? That's, that's huge, right? Um, you know, people want to participate. People don't want to have things hidden from them or, or put behind some massive paywall or, or things like that. Yeah, and it's actually quite incredible to see what uh, you know what people can do uh, when given 
the ability and the access to do it. So but yeah, fascinating stuff. It's certainly a testament to the time that we're in and you know, I can't wait to see more. So until next time, this is Alex, the Resident Chaos Coordinator.